It's Pentecost Sunday. It ends the Easter season and we move into a time of uh, God sending the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. And during this time, um, they receive the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit allows them to kind of go out into the world and to speak to different people and to just spread the message of the good news, of the gospel, of all the things that Jesus has done and that how Jesus' life, death, and resurrection has made it possible for us to live differently. And the disciples are called upon in this task to do that. Uh, one of them, uh, one of our New Testament writers, uh, Paul, speaks very specifically about the Spirit and the Spirit as it comes down. And I want to read one of our lectionary passages this morning. It's from Romans 8, uh, 14 through 17. Just a few verses. But this is what Paul says about this Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that comes upon us at Pentecost. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may be also glorified with him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God, amen. Paul, in chapter 8 of Romans, of his letter to the Romans, is speaking about this spirit because we, Christ promises the spirit to the disciples and says that the spirit will teach them everything and sends the spirit upon them. And that, that's, that's what we celebrate on Pentecost, that moment when they're in the upper room and the tongues of fire and then they spread out into the street. They, they spill out into the street spreading the good news to all people in all languages. And Paul begins to speak with the church about what that spirit does. And one of the things that the spirit does is not, it's help us to move out of a kind of bondage to fear. Fear is a great motivator in our society. Uh, we use it sometimes uh, with our children, you know, like don't, uh, don't come down stairs at Christmas Eve or Santa won't bring you any presents or something like this. Or sometimes we use, we use fear to kind of control like, uh, and, and in some cases it's a good thing, but when we get older, fear can become a different kind of motivator for us. Uh, we can use fear to sort of uh, control in some way. Uh, we are taught sometimes to be afraid of all kinds of things. We're taught to be afraid of people who are different. Uh, we're taught to be afraid of poor people. Or uh, in, our, in our society now, I hear people come and talk to me about politics and you know, you have one side that is terrified of another side. Uh, Republicans being terrified of Democrats or Democrats being terrified of Republicans. And we use that fear to sort of drum up some kind of action in our life. And yet here, Paul says that those who abide in the Spirit do not fall into a kind of bondage to fear. Fear is not the motivator for when it, when it comes to how we interact with people. Yeah, sometimes when we fear a certain group of people, we tend to treat them in a certain way. But Paul says that this spirit that came down, this same spirit, he says, bears witness with our spirit. It's this phrase that Paul uses a couple times uh, in Romans. He will use bearing witness as if somehow that is these things dwelling together. As if somehow Christ 
ascends and then sends the Spirit, and the Spirit through Christ allows us to sort of unify with God and that God somehow dwells within us. This is a popular thing for mystics and medieval theologians to talk about is that the Spirit of God actually lives and dwells within us. And Paul says when this happens, when we start to realize that the Spirit of God is dwelling within us, then we don't have to fall back into fear. We don't have to be in bondage to fear. An example, maybe, I was racking my brain to find some example of what this fear may look like. And the best I could say was, uh, there are times when someone hurts me and I want to lash out at them. Uh, I'm sure many of us feel this. And many times when we are hurt, we fear for our lives. We fear for something. We fear that we're losing something if someone is unkind to us. And so we want to lash out. But what I think Paul is saying is when our spirit bears witness with God's spirit, that when God's spirit resides within us, there is a different way to act in the world as opposed to retaliation there might be a way forward for redemption or compassion or love or forgiveness. So really, it changes. When the Spirit dwells in us, it might change the way in which we love others, the way in which we uh, move and have our being in the world when the Spirit is in us. And sometimes we think about, well, how do I get the Spirit? Or how does that happen? I think it's more about recognizing the Spirit because I believe that God dwells in all people. And if we begin to recognize that the Spirit of God abides with us, it allows us to act differently in the world. We can respond to uh, crisis, or we can respond to different things in our own emotional lives, in our own social lives, very differently. We can respond like Christ responds, by caring and forgiving and loving others. In fact, Thomas Merton says, It is by the Holy Spirit that we love those who are united to us in Christ. The more plentifully we have received of the Spirit of Christ, the more, perfect, the more perfectly we are able to love them. And the more we love them, the more we receive the Spirit. I love this because it suggests that in my own life when I love my children or my family or I love someone that I find it really, really hard to love, that that love is the same love that Christ has. So in that, we are abiding with the Spirit when we love one another. And especially when we find those groups or, or, or something in our society that we find it so hard to love. When we begin to abide with the Spirit, can love them. In fact, Merton goes on to suggest that that love is not just our love, but when we love someone, it is Christ loving them in and through us. I don't think that Christ ascends and sends the Spirit upon the disciples for just the simple fact of Christ wanted to sort of be with them. But I, I think that that's true, but I also think that Christ sends the Spirit so that when we are united with the Spirit, we might be able to act like Christ or at least begin to learn to love one another. So perhaps if you find someone that's very, very hard to love, um, which sometimes I think I am very hard to love too, perhaps if we draw closer to the Spirit, it will help us to love in a way that not only unites us with that other person, but unites us with the Spirit of God and with Christ. So take heart. If we react in one way, in a harsh way, or we just don't feel like we want to love, the Spirit is there inside of us dwelling to help us and to teach us how to love more. And I think that might be the spirit of Pentecost, to transform the Christian people around the world and all people around the world, to learn to love and to care, to be compassionate for one another. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 